Amen. Amen. Praise God. <clears throat> it's wonderful to still be able to preach to you after so many things that happened. In tw- How many of you glad 2023 is going to be over? <laughs> I'm excited for 2024. And I believe God has greater things for us. Okay, here we go. I don't have a verse that I put there, but I would like to read one, so I ask everybody to stand. And if you have your Bibles, it won't be on the screen. It's in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 to 18. It's in the part of the, uh, in the outline, but <clears throat> it's not in the beginning, but let me read it to you. For this reason, Jesus, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Emmanuel, our enduring hope, you know, only... We celebrate Father's Day one day. We celebrate Mother's Day one day. We celebrate Easter maybe two days. We celebrate, uh, you know, Independence Day one day. But our birthday one day. But, you know, we celebrate Christmas three months (laughs) in the Philippines. Amen. And that's a lot of things uh, inside that that maybe it's just tradition. But there's a lot of reasons why we need to celebrate. And I'd like to take you to an understanding of what it is when the Bible says Emmanuel. And I spoke about this last year, last Christmas, but I wanted to expound on it for this year in three parts. And so let's come to the Lord and pray. Father, we are so grateful that we are all here this morning. And we know, Lord, that through many times of difficulties and trials, still, Father God, we experience your goodness and how you have been so faithful in everything that we had to go through and in meeting all our needs and helping us through the difficult times. And we're so excited, Father God, for the coming year. The world might be in fear. There's a war in Europe. There's a war in the Middle East. There's an impending war in Asia. But we all know, Lord, that our future, our tomorrow is in your hands. And you are the one in charge of everything, Father God. So we are grateful and we are hopeful because you are Emmanuel. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please, before you take your seat, say to the person next to you, welcome home. Amen. I don't know how, how you celebrated Christmas. I know that Jesus flock is a celebrator all the time. When we have the chance, we will celebrate. We will take, take the time. Uh, I mean, we had a great, wonderful Christmas service, party service on the 17th. How many of you won something during that day? <laughs> and everybody's excited to, to win a prize. And I think there's always a reason to celebrate. And I think what is important is we understand why we are celebrating. And... Uh, you know, I know uh, I, some of you made a little bit a great effort in trying to decorate your house. I know my brother-in-law did. He spent 16 hours building a Christmas village. <laughs> 16 hours, you know, it's nonstop. And so I know that all of you, some of you would take the time to just go ahead and decorate. I know Eric spends a lot of time decorating because it's part of celebration. In, if you read the Christmas story, it's all about celebration, and God is just excited. And how the angels broke in song when they realized the miracle was about to take place. Let me explain that to you. Before we end this season, uh, <clears throat> let's dive into the meaning of the word Emmanuel. You see, Emmanuel has three phases in its meaning. I think we sang two parts of it in the song, The Blessing. The first part is Emmanuel is God like us. Now, this is very important because when you talk about a miracle, this is the miracle 
of miracles. Let me read again to you Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 to 18. For this reason, Jesus had to be made like them, like us, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted and is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, it is necessary for Jesus to be born as a human. He's not like a Superman coming from Krypton, coming as a baby and, you know, becoming a superhero or maybe, uh, you know, some other form of a superhero. But he was born like any one of us. When God sent Jesus, he sent him here to be like us. Now, I want you to wrap your mind around that. So he's like his brothers and sisters his cousins, every one of them is like Jesus. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said this in 1 Timothy 3.16. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up to glory. Appeared in the flesh. In John 1, 14, we all know it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and glory as the one only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, that's so important. When you say Jesus was born as a human, He was not God disguised as, uh, as human. He was not God trying to put on the robe of humanity. He was born like you and me. In, in Philippians 2, 6 and 7, it says, Christ Jesus, who is being born in the form of God, who was being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, came, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Emmanuel is God like us. God loves us so much that he didn't send an email, he didn't send a telegram, he didn't send a messenger. He sent his son. When he sent his son, he didn't send him to become like a Moses or like a, like a David. He sent his son to be born like one of us, not just as a man with a special, special mission. He became human. Now, I don't know if you really understand that, but there's nothing, not anything that you have ever experienced or will experience in, in our lives as a human being that Jesus does not understand. He understands our loneliness. He understands our weaknesses. He understands our strength. He understands all the setbacks that we go through in our lives. Jesus walked around in a body, in a body he experienced everything that it means to be a human. Now, I don't know if I've, I've understood this, but it really didn't sink into my mind until recently. In Isaiah 53 verse 5, it says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Look at those words, wounded, bruised, chastised, stripes. He felt the pain you and I feel. And he understands every one of us will go through pain. Any one of us will go through difficulties in life, and Jesus had to go through it himself. The humanity of Jesus is very easy to prove. The divinity, of course, is another, on another, uh, another side. But the humanity is very easy. He was born. He grew up. He had brothers and sisters. He became tired and thirsty. He, was, he grew hungry and became physically weak. He suffered and he died. And one author says about Jesus being really human, that when he has not, not enough to eat, he goes hungry. When he did not sleep, he got tired. <clears throat> the soldiers pushed the uh, crown of thorns in, into his skin, into his scalp, and drove his nails, and it hurt. And the most profound evidence of all that Jesus was human is he died. Just like all of us will. <clears throat> he didn't just seem to die. He didn't pretend to die. He didn't die halfway. He didn't kind of die. He died as a human would die. He died the death of humanity. <clears throat> but the story does not end in his death. 
You see, there's no going around the human body of the Lord, but I'd like to let you understand it's not just what he had experienced, it's what he had felt. He was human. He felt compassion. He was angry. He was indignant. He was consumed with zeal. The Bible says he was troubled. He was greatly distressed. He was sorrowful. He was depressed. He was deeply moved and grieved. He had sighed. He wept. He sobbed. He groaned. He was in agony. He was surprised. He was amazed. He rejoiced greatly and was full of joy. Just like you and I, he felt all the aspects of emotion. Finally, not only that, the humanity of Jesus, he thought the way we think. He had to develop his abilities in thinking, in his intellect. One of the hard things to wrap around my mind on the humanity of Jesus is that he had to study. He had to go through the reg re uh, regiments of going to school. He had to study the Hebrew scriptures. He had to memorize them. His intellect, he was, he was developing his intellect. And the Bible says he grew in wisdom and in stature, not only physically, but also intellectually. Now think about that. Now, what's, a lot of people don't understand this miracle. Jesus became human, listen to me, permanently human. He became human. Up to now, he has his human nature. If we would have his both divine and human nature in heaven, if we would have a telescope today and we can beam and look at a sea, heaven, its throne, we would see God the Father. We would see Jesus not as an ethereal spirit beside the Father, but with a body. Jesus' body that bore the scars on his, on his hands, on his side, on his head. Jesus actually still carries the scars even today. And sometimes when you try to understand that, you realize, man, God took a lot of effort to bring salvation to us because he became like us. Philip Yancey said, a famous author, he says, in Jesus, something new happened. God became one of his own creatures. An event unparalleled unheard on the fact that in the fullness sense of the word of God, who fills the universe, imploded to become a peasant baby, who, like every infant who has ever lived, had learned to walk and talk and dress himself in the incarnation. God's Son deliberately handicapped himself to be like you and like me. Now, I want you to understand this. He is exactly like the person you're seated next to, person at your back, person at your front. Jesus is just like us. That's very important. <clears throat> then we understand how much effort, to what measure, did God went in order to express his love for us. That's what Emmanuel means, the miracle of miracles, God becoming human. The second meaning of Emmanuel is God is with us. Now, I spent a whole message that, of this last year, but I'd like just to emphasize a few things. You know, I want everybody to say, everybody, all together, one, two, three, Emmanuel. One, two, three, Emmanuel. That's a special name. Only mentioned three times in the whole scripture, twice in Isaiah and once in the New Testament in Matthew. The Lord himself in Isaiah says, will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And it's amazing because it's, this reference was coded in the book of Matthew, and it says, Behold, the virgin shall give a child, will be with child, and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Now, I love this because when you understand, oh, God sits on the heavens, it's far away, but he is closer to you than you think. He is with us. He is with us. He is close at hand. You know, he knows when you go through life, the daily drudgery of waking up in the morning and going to work. I know everybody will be so down on January 2. You have to go back to the office and you have to report to the same old people you've been reporting with for the last couple of years. I know it's miserable when you think, okay, can we just have Christmas for like one whole year? <laughs> you see, the misery, the back toil, breaking toil, 
the shares of our trials and our limitations, Jesus was born poor. With us, no place to lay his head. He was hungry, grateful to the converted woman who ministered to him in the, woman, in, in the well in Samaria, giving her water to drink. He was exhausted. He was called as a man of sorrows, a man acquainted with grief. Brothers and sisters, he's not only like us, he is with us. When we need him the most, that's when he is the most with us. Amen. When he need, we need him the most, that's when he is the most with us. <clears throat> I'm really happy to live this year because this year I was diagnosed with cancer. You know, and I, every day after receiving that diagnosis, I kept on confessing, I am free, I am healed, you know. But every week I report to the doctor, it gets worse and worse and worse, you know. He kept on withholding to me the information for the coming week. So for five weeks after I, I got diagnosed, I went back to the doctor week after week. And every time I go there, I get discouraged, you know, especially when he says, you have to make a choice. Either you go to a surgery or you go to radiation. But this radiation is going to be one of a kind, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, so I had, to, I had to submit myself to that. You know, I took a medical leave from church, although that doesn't really work out. And then uh, when you go to the hospital, uh, how many of you, if you've ever been to the hospital for an operation or something, how many of you know you leave your dignity outside the door? <laughs> I remember asking me to wear that gown. Man, I hope nobody takes my picture. You know, and then, uh, so, and I'm so glad there's no member of my church who's a nurse inside that hospital. <laughs> but you just have to swallow your pride and say, okay, Lord, let's do whatever. Four days in a hospital, two days, uh, I had to go through the procedure. And during that time, Abel couldn't be with me. And uh, I can tell you, to be honest, and I'm not trying to be sentimental, but that was one of the loneliest moments I've ever felt in my life. You know, and, and, but during that time, and in the most, most crucial, in, you know, grueling moments of that treatment, and I don't want to describe it to you because it's, we're in church and there are kids here. <laughs> but I can tell you this. God was with me, Emmanuel. I have never, ever felt that he was out away far from me. I couldn't remember the songs. I couldn't watch any, any movie on television. I couldn't listen to the music because I was always vomiting. I was in, in pain. I was going through some difficult, uh, you know, condition. And yet, I knew in my heart he was with me. And I can tell you, some of you understand this. Some of you have gone through some times in your life, tragic moments, and you just know that He is with you. And you could not explain it. But the only thing I can say is, Emmanuel, He is with us. The Lord Jesus was with me every minute. He never left me. You know, He reminded me that He is there by giving me a nurse that looks like Pastor Herman. You know, <laughs> And every time I look at him, I smile and says, oh, thank you, Lord. <clears throat> anyway, did you know that he is always there with you? You're never alone since the first Christmas. Since you first became a believer, you are never alone. He says in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He will never leave us. He will always be there until the rapture happens. Jesus would let us forget that Emmanuel is an eternal presence. He's with us today. He will be with, there with us tomorrow. <clears throat> I'm sure, you know, you all know the statistics that during Christmas season, psychologists and psychiatrists, counselors have their busiest schedule. A lot of people get unplugged during Christmas season. Fear of loneliness, reality hits them, and they find themselves alone, and they needed somebody to talk to. But if you are a believer, and if you understand what the first Christmas did, 
He is Emmanuel. He is with us. He is like us. He is with us. Listen to the Hebrews, the uh, writer of the book of Hebrews. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I would uphold you with my righteous hand. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is not only here during the Christmas season. He's here in all seasons. In your darkest moments, in your highest of highs, in your lowest of lows, in every situation, He is with you. Nobody can dispute His name, Emmanuel. Just remember, Emmanuel has come. <clears throat> you can never, he would, he would, when you feel discouraged, he would stay with you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as, as we are yet without sin. Now that's so important. You say, well, nobody understands me, Pastor Jerome. I'm going through some terrible times. I have, nobody probably has gone through what I'm going through. That's not true. Every single feeling, every single temptation you've gone through, the Lord felt it. He went through it. Let me give you a better translation to the Message Bible. It says, now that we know we have Jesus, the great high priest, with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all. All but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. The writer of Hebrews was saying, we should boldly come to Jesus the way he boldly came to us on the first Christmas. And therefore, as we boldly come to him, just let him know what you're going through, whatever you experienced. And I believe God will express and manifest himself to you. Amen. <clears throat> he came. He became one of us. And he is always going to, he promised to stay. He will not, he will not play around with words. He knows how you feel. He understands what you think. He experienced the circumstances of your life. The seemingly unique circumstance that only you probably think is going through he has gone through it, been there, done that. Brings me to the final point. Emmanuel is not only God like us, God with us, but it is God for us. Amen? I mean, that's worth celebrating, amen? He is for you. He's part of your team. He's not against you. The Lord is not trying to make your life difficult. He is with you. When you go to the office on January 2, when you start to work on your business, when you go back to your regular work, just remember, He is for you. He is for the situations that happens in your life. He wants joy and blessing in your life. He wants you to have abundant life. <clears throat> I love the way Paul puts it in the book of Romans, in Romans 8.31, when it says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Just think about that. If God is for you, who can be against you? You might say, well, I've been a victim of injustice. I've gone through certain abuse. I've felt all kinds of unfair treatment. I was bullied and etc. and all of that. But I can tell you this. If you're a child of God, the Lord is for you. And he will make everything work together for good according to his pleasure. Amen. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 says, this is the love of God was manifest toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Verse 10, in, the, in, in this love, not that we love God, but that God loved us, sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So the word manifest there means something made visible, manifested His love to us. It's taking the cover off. 
It's unwrapping a gift. He didn't send a message. He didn't send a messenger. He sent His only begotten Son. And that Son is Emmanuel. When God showed His love for us, He showed it with the biggest, greatest gift. His only begotten Son. Jesus said, we are told, came to earth as a baby, that we might have true life, that we might live this life through Him. William Barclay explains it this way. <clears throat> everybody has existence, but not everybody has life. Jesus gives us someone for which to live. He gives us strength for which to live. He gives us peace in which to live. With Jesus, there comes into the life the thrill of a great adventure, the strength to master life's frustrations, and a background of contentedness living. In Christ, turns mere existence into the fullness of life. You see, if we realize that He didn't create you just so you can watch the next, tele, the next television series, in create you so can you get binge watching Netflix or whatever it is that you're watching or you know the next tele, uh, telenovela a, a Korean telenovela. Do you know he created you and the only thing that can satisfy your you as a creation of God is for you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, Amen. And it's almost forty years ago. You know, twenty twenty four is leap year. So those who are not married. <laughs> This is your chance. <laughs> After 40 years, you know, the church was born during a leap year. Did you know that? 1984. We started it when we were uh, uh, just coming out of high school and college. And, uh, and during that time, we got incorporated in February 29, 1984. So I think for the first time after so many years, we'll celebrate it exactly on February 29. And so... <clears throat> But I remember, of course, 20 years later, we started Jesus Revolution. I remember when we started our church, we never knew what we're going to be doing. One year after we started the church, Abel and I got married. We had an orphanage. We had an academy. We had all kinds of things going on. We never knew what's going to happen in the ministry. We never thought that God's going to take us through so many parts of the world. And, uh, but what we do know is everywhere we go when our boys were small, we brought our boys with us. When a bell has a performance on mime and dance somewhere, we bring the babies. We bring the children. They're, the children, you know, would just play around, do whatever they want to do, but they were always part of the ministry. And when we went to Bolivia, we brought Johan with us, you know, and, uh, because she's the nurse. But he didn't do anything, but, but he's the nurse. So... <clears throat> In Indonesia, Bolivia, Australia, and everywhere we go, if we can bring our boys, we bring them with us. You see, and here's the result. After, some, after 40 years, I can believe our boys, they love ministry. They love being church. They love working part of the ministry. And to me, that's an extra blessing. I know some preachers' kids would you know, would stay away as much as they want from the ministry. But I want to tell you this. If, you know, I don't want to just discuss that, but I feel that in my heart, the real joy of serving God is when you are able to find your whole family serve God together. You know, I had many de near-death experiences. Uh, three years ago was one of the worst. And last year was just a threat of death. But, whether or not you get the next goal in your life that you have put in your chart, I think it's more important that Jesus is in our hearts. Bible says He will give us abundant life. Listen, He didn't plan uh, a stingy kind of life. He didn't plan a remote kind of living. He, he planned an abundant life for all of us. And if we understand the word Emmanuel, that he's not only like us, he's not only with us, but he is for us. He is for the work that you do. He's for your business. He's for your family. He's for every single part, aspect of your life. He's for your career. And because of that, he 
His love is so immense. How could we not love Him back? You know, Bible says, uh, scarcely a righteous man will die for somebody, but nobody will die for somebody. Maybe somebody would die for somebody that's good. But can somebody die for a sinner? Bible says God commanded His love towards that the way we were, we were still sinners. Christ died for us. You know, when we are sinners, He died for us. Listen to me, friends. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is like us. He is with us. And He is for us. Let me close with a story that I heard, and I often checked it, of course, fact-checked it, December 24, 1906. Something happened that never happened before. The sailors at the sea heard a voice over an electronic box, 1908-1906. This box is called a radio, but before that, all they heard was Morse code. But on December 24, Christmas Eve, 1906, a voice was heard for the first time on radio. And you know what the voice says? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Luke 2.24. The first words spoken over the radio were scripture. The greatest words ever to be spoken on planet earth. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Something happened 2,000 years ago that changed the world. Emmanuel was born. 2,000 years ago, it changed the world. It can change our life as well. I would like to call the worship team, and I'd like to come and come before the Lord. But before we do that, I'd like to give you one question before we close. Are you... Born again, the greatest question that will be asked of you in your lifetime, are you born again? You see, we're all born from a hospital. We're born with parents. But have you been born in the Spirit? And someone would ask me, Pastor Jerome, I mean, I, I, I had discussed this with Abel sisters in the United States with all these other issues going around. But I'm going to give a very simple invitation for all of us tonight, oh, this morning. It's called the ABCs of salvation. How do you get born again? Number one, admit that we're a sinner. Admit that we're broken people. Admit that not, nothing in ourselves could ever bring us to God. Heaven does not, re heaven requires a reservation. You can't just knock at the door of heaven and say, I'm here. I want to go to heaven. We're all sinners that needed a Savior. We're not a mistaker that needed a correction. We don't need a second chance. We need a second birth. All we need to do is admit, yes, Lord, I can, I can admit I'm a sinner. Some people reach up to their deathbed before they say, I lived a terrible life. I'm a sinner. Don't wait until your deathbed. Admit that we're sinners. Number two, letter B, it's A, B, C. Believe that God sent His Son to become our sin bearer that came down to die the death that we should have died, to live the life that we couldn't live so that we might be rewarded that we do not deserve. That's what the Lord did. And all we need to do is believe. And finally, let us see confess him as lord and that's the most one of the most important thing you know it's the pivot of changing a religion to relationship when you start to confess him as lord romans 10 9 romans 9 and 10 tells us that we need to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth when jesus came 2000 years ago he died on the cross it's not for you to go to church it's for you to go to heaven with Him. Amen? See, perfect people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. So, 
this morning, I'm going to ask everybody to just bow your heads. And I'm asking even the children, even the, the small ones, if you want to be born again, really be born again, admit that you're a sinner, believe in Jesus, and confess Him as Lord. Very simple, but very true. And then He will be born in your heart today. So if you want to say, Pastor Jerome, I've been coming to church, but I never knew if I was really born again. But I really want to be born again today. And uh, all the heads are bowed, the eyes are closed. I want you to just go ahead and raise up your hand and say, I want to be born again today, really. Even the young people, even the children. If you want to be born again, raise your hands. Yes, thank you. Just raise your hand. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. It's between you and the Lord. The Lord can see those hands. I really want to be born again right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I, I can see around six people raising their hands. Don't be, don't be embarrassed to do that. It's between you and the Lord. Let's pray together. And I want us everybody to pray together. Everybody can ask you to stand, please. And we're going to join those who raise their hands so they will not feel, feel embarrassed. We're all going to pray together and, and say this very simple prayer so that we can be born again. Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. From this day forward, I give my life to you. Use me for your glory. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. And I will live for you. I say it aloud so I can hear myself. So all the devils and the demons can hear it. I say it aloud. So all the angels can hear. I belong to Jesus. And Jesus belongs to me. We thank you, Father God. We give you praise for those who sincerely pray that prayer to receive you today. I congratulate those who receive the Lord. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's worship Him.